Hi, everybody. My name's Trenton Bennett. I'm a podcaster, and I'm also an audiobook narrator, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So, one of the things that podcasters and audiobook narrators have in common is we're storytellers. This really speaks to something primal about humans. We love to have people tell us stories. We love to tell stories. And as a podcaster, that's what you do. Even if you're doing an interview-style podcast, you're focusing on someone else's story and you're helping them tell that. Audiobooks do much the same thing in a variety of ways, just like your podcast might have one or more different formats to it. So that said, let's dive in today a little bit about what it would be like to get into the audiobook space as a podcaster. And I'll try to answer some of your questions and also give you an opportunity at the end to have my contact information and reach out to me for any more follow-up. So the basics are, audiobooks themselves are part of a market that's been growing very rapidly over the last several years. Not just podcasts are on the rise, but audiobooks have been dramatically on the rise too. There are a lot more people consuming those, and those people have a lot in common with your podcast listeners. A lot of them are podcast listeners too. So the reason probably for that is that most people like to listen to an audiobook whenever they're, they want to read, but maybe their hands are tied, like they're driving, and they can't really pick up a book. Please don't do that. Uh, they're, they're out there on a treadmill at the gym, and they're running, or they're going for a bike ride, or they're outside, or they're inside, and they're doing some cleaning up. They're just doing various activities where my hands are tied. I want something to do to kind of keep my brain occupied, so I'll put on an audiobook. People love to do that, just like they love to listen to a podcast. And again, it's because they want to hear a good story. So when we talk about that, those listeners are in some situations that it's my job as an audiobook narrator to handle the situation they're in by recording something that sounds really clear, is easy to understand, and they're able to pay enough attention to it to get something out of it. But what that means is, I just mentioned people are cleaning and they're exercising and they're driving. Whatever I produce has to compete with the sound of that treadmill or that car engine, or maybe even that vacuum cleaner, depending on how they're listening to stuff. So I have to produce things in a way that is very audible, very easy to understand, and very clear. Podcasters don't necessarily have to hit the same bars. I'm going to speak a little bit to some of the technical specifics that you would need to do for an audiobook that aren't necessarily expected or required for a podcast. When you're a podcaster, for the most part, your content is being delivered just like you and me talking. We're having a conversation, and you can keep track of everything I'm saying. But in an audiobook, I'm painting a visual picture. I'm describing everything that's going around, and I'm doing the character's dialogue, and describing the sets and their motivations and their feelings inside. So I have to slow my pace. And as an audiobook narrator, I have to give the words time to land in the ears of the listener. That's really important because you're throwing a lot of information at your listeners, and they're having to build a mental image off of that and still be engaged as the characters are talking. So you have to kind of moderate, or as one of my favorite coaches says, slow your roll and give it a good storyteller's pace. When you flip in and out of dialogue, your people talking don't sound like that. They don't say, hi there, he said. And then he proceeded to start shouting, I'm very angry right now. There's, there's a little more dynamic to it. So you move your role in and out of, I'm narrator voice and I'm describing the scene. And here's someone talking and they're doing something bright and bubbly that's moving at a regular pace. And then she said, this thing happened and so on. So it's really kind of about the pacing too. That's a technique that you learn with time. And the beauty of being an audiobook narrator is I get to be the producer and the director, and I'm every character, and I'm the set, and I'm all of the props, too. <laughs> so there's a lot of stepping in and out of different roles and doing different things as you're going along narrating, but I get to cheat. I get to cheat. The author has given me everything I need right there in the text. They've given me all the words. 
They've given me all the tools I need to both understand what the writer is trying to say and then paint that picture for the listener. Of course, the flip side to that is an audiobook narrator has an identity crisis because I'm everybody, and sometimes I don't agree with myself because I get into arguments and I have these conflicts where I'm the good guy and the bad guy. That's actually kind of fun to do, though. I mean, it's really one of my favorite things about narrating audiobooks is I also get to do some acting. So when it comes to getting into this, it also helps to have some really good acting skills. Come from an acting background, study acting, practice this a little bit. Uh, there's one other piece to that, though, that I think is, is really useful, because everything I'm telling you today, it comes with time and practice, but you want to kind of take note of what I'm telling you and keep this in mind as you build your skills. So, for example, when it comes to acting, um, when you study in a character, I actually read the audiobook a couple of times. I read the script before I actually start recording. The first time I go through the script, the, the book. But the first time I go through the book, I'm reading the book and I'm not really reading it. I'm just checking it for speed bumps. I have to make sure, for example, that if there's a character name that's unusual, if there's a place name that I don't know how to say, or if there's words in other languages, I'm going to need some help with that. I'm going to need to either do research or find the pronunciation or ask the author what is the intention here? What's this supposed to be? So the first time I go through the book, I'm just looking for things that I'm going to need to check and get ready beforehand. That's my prep work. I make sure that, okay, if these characters are coming up, what do I know about these characters? The last thing you want to do is not read the book, just go into recording, and right around chapter 10, they just happen to mention that this character has a very thick Irish accent, and you've been speaking them general American all along. So... <laughs> It's important to at least be familiar with the mechanics of the script. Make notes, check up on everything, and be ready to go chapter by chapter. That's my first pass-through. But then my second pass-through is all about that acting technique. I'm going to actually read the book. I'm going to try to understand what's going on with the characters. What are they thinking? What are their motivations? What drives them? What makes them interesting to other people? So that's my second pass, and by that time I'm familiar enough with the material that as I go recording chapter by chapter, I'm already prepared. I know who's going to be talking. I've probably practiced and drilled on accents or on language bits that are in another language, and I've made sure that I've done all of that homework. Now, that said, every audiobook project is going to vary. I had one that had over 50 different characters, and the author wanted me to express every character as an individual voice, acted out as their own distinct voices. That's a real challenge. But I've also had romance books where you've got four characters, and one of them is just an extra who shows up for a little bit. And those are a lot easier to roll through. No foreign languages, no unusual accents. So it's always going to vary from project to project. One of the things I get asked a lot is, do I have to talk in different voices? Can I talk in different voices if I want to? The answer is yes, and yes, and no, and no. <laughs> so, a lot of times, narrators just go through and they read the book, and when they get into different character voices, they speak in their normal voice, and they just make slight changes to pitch, so that you know this is a person talking, that is a different person talking, this is another person talking, and they don't flip into it really detailed. That's perfectly fine. A lot of narrators do that. You don't have to do those voices if you don't want to. Some want the challenge. So when you look for a project and they want you to do accents and dialects, or they want you to do a particular kind of voice, and you like doing that sort of thing, you can absolutely go for it. I have had some really good training in accents and dialects to be very careful about how I put all of it together so that it sounds convincing. But at the end of the day, don't let that terrify you. Don't let that wrap you around the axle about, I have to be a master at all of the world's different enunciations of the English language. It's, just, it's not like that. Actually, it's more important that when it comes to accents, less is more. Uh, you want to work through it in a way where you're pretty well familiar with it, you've been speaking with it for a while to get your ear familiar to how to do it, and then you record the chapter with that particular accent or dialect, and you do it minimally. You don't make grand flourishes. Because your audiobook listener, they understand that 
you're just like an actor stepping on the stage who they're American, they're doing Shakespeare, and they want to speak in the received pronunciation that is very dramatic English. So everybody understands you're playing a role, and you get to play all the roles as an audiobook narrator, so the rules are a little different for you, which also is kind of fun. So let's talk a little bit about how we do this. And I say this because I've had podcasters come at me asking for a variety of angles of getting into audiobooks. The most common one I hear is, how do I just start narrating audiobooks? I've given you some pointers, and I'll elaborate on that in a moment. But first, I want to take a moment and talk to the writers. There are a lot of people who are saying, I'm working on a book. I want to publish that book, and then I want to narrate it, or I want to hire a narrator to narrate it. What do I do? That one is really simple, so I'm going to take a moment and talk about that. If you're a writer and you want to get into the audiobook space, the easiest way to do all of this, of course, is to focus on Amazon and Audible, which is owned by Amazon. To do that, you get your book published on Amazon, and then you produce your audiobook. Amazon uses a company called ACX. ACX is short for Audiobook Creators Exchange. It's a clearinghouse where writers and narrators get together and they produce the audiobook, and then that gets pushed out to Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. So you would be working through ACX. So you're a writer, you've published your book on Amazon, and the next thing you do is you go to acx.com and you log in with your Amazon credentials, and you go find your book, and then you assert your rights. This is my book. I'm pulling it up in ACX and saying, I assert that I am the rights holder. I have the right to do this book. So when you assert your rights as the rights holder, you're going to hear me talk about rights holders going forward. And I say that because a lot of times when you do an audiobook, the author is the rights holder, but it might not be. There are sometimes companies that buy the right from the author, and they are the rights holders, and they're who you work with on your audiobook project. Let's go the other route now, and let's talk about you're a narrator, and you want to look for work. You also create an ACX account, and you go looking for work that needs an audition, and you audition for that work, and you submit it. So when you submit those, you just keep auditioning, and eventually you get a project that you want to do, and you get to work on it. You need to take care of them. That's their baby that they want to get out to market. And so they're going to rely on you to be on time, to do the work, and also when you hand it back to them to get their feedback. You have a back and forth process where you have them act as a second set of ears to listen for mistakes, to make sure you didn't miss anything. Because even if I've read this book twice through and I'm narrating, my eyeballs and my mouth might not do the same thing. I regularly will see words and then I'll goof it and not know until I'm listening and playing it back. So you'll have mistakes you have to fix, and you work with them, and they call those mistakes pickups. So you might find that you made a goof and you have to do a pickup. Let's talk about the actual technique that goes behind it. So for example, when we talk about pickups, we talked about how podcasts have a little bit of a different rule as far as the quality of the recording. And we've also talked about how there's more of an acting technique that goes into it that most podcasts don't do. So that acting is very important. But then the last piece of that puzzle is the technique that you use for your microphone. I use a cardioid condenser mic called an Audio-Technica AT2020 USB Plus. And I tell you this because this particular mic, it's a cardioid condenser mic. It means that this mic will pick up a whole lot of stuff, and it lets me do a whole lot of microphone technique. But the downside to that is that I also have to be aware that everything else in the room could be picked up, and I need a good, quiet space to work in. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But first, let's talk about technique. So you see, I don't have a pop filter sitting in front of it. But I have this sock that's wrapped around the mic a couple of times, and it creates a barrier so that when I talk, mostly my voice is going to get through that barrier. And the most important thing here is this stops what's called a plosive. When I speak, if I do a letter P or another sound, a CH, a consonant, those are going to puff some air. And if that air puffs across the mic, you hear the woof of a plosive. You can't have plosives in an audiobook. You would have to go back and edit those out. 
So you want to be careful and use your technique properly. And that means that sometimes if a character is whispering, I'll move a little bit closer or I'll move further away. But if there's a plosive, I'm probably going to slightly tip and, and work the technique. It comes with time and you notice I'm not doing this, am I? I'm not doing this and talking straight into a mic. It's not necessarily over my head. Some people do that and that's fine. I happen to use a technique where I talk across the mic and I talk across the pickup and it's just slightly turned so that it's less likely to catch plosives. But the other thing about the plosives and the reason I love the AT2020 USB Plus is the plus in the name is all about this little thing. This little microphone jack thing here that actually lets you stick in a set of earbuds and you can hear exactly how the mic is picking you up in real time as it's picking you up. This is really important, especially when you're first getting started with audiobooks, because when you can hear immediately that you do a plosive, you know you've got to do a pickup. So you know right then and there. You don't finish the whole chapter, then you get and sit down and start producing and go, great, now I got to go re record that one and that one and that one, and that one, and that one. Ah, that gets really frustrating. So keep that in mind and look into in-ear monitoring. I also want to take a moment and talk about one of the most important fundamentals for recording an audiobook that a podcaster doesn't have to worry about. You need a really good space. You need to record in a space that is not noisy. If you can, you want to avoid a space that's empty and has a lot of flat, hard surfaces because that creates a reflective sound and a reverberation. A lot of people tackle this a lot of ways, but there's a really easy way that you can get started that I did for the first two years of my narration. You can use a closet. I had a walk-in closet and I left the clothes in because the clothes dampened the sound. It was like having my own booth. It was really quiet. It was isolated. Everything was muffled. And that way I could record in that space. If you don't have a closet, you can do a variety of different solutions. People will build everything from their own personal booth made of PVC pipe and moving blankets to actually building a room within a room in their house where they've dedicated it and they've, they've framed inner walls that don't touch the outer walls. There's, there's a lot of different degrees to go to that. But the important principle here is have a really good space to begin with. That's going to be very important for you. It sounds like the kind of thing where you can go, well, if it's noisy, I can just fix it in the software. Don't do that. Really don't. That creates a lot more headache down the road. It increases the margin of error. And more importantly, it actually, even light noise reduction, even a little bit of it, takes away some of the quality of your voice. It flattens it and deadens it out as it's trying to kill background noise. So try to avoid that by just having a good space to start with. So that brings me to the mechanics of it in regards to software. Your software can be simple. If you like Pro Tools or you're really good at Adobe Audition, knock yourself out. That's great. Go ahead and, and do all of that as you want to do it. If you don't, don't feel like you have to know all of those things. I do most of my recording with Audacity, which is a free software package that just does the job. It's a Swiss Army knife for recording. I use that to record everything. I get done with my chapters. I do a little bit of production work on it, and then it's off to market. You can use software of any kind, including free software, and still produce a good piece if you have a good space, and you use good mic technique, and you're careful to make sure you don't have any plosives. So there you go. I feel like I've hit a lot of the highlights because people ask me this sort of stuff, but I have a little bit of extra time at the end and I want to make sure you have my contact info to reach out to me. So if you want to get in touch with any follow-up questions, you can email me at trenton at trentonbennett.com. Bennett has two N's and two T's. And you can also find me at trentonbennett.com. I'm on Facebook as Trenton Bennett. And I have a Facebook voiceover page called Voice of Trenton. There's a lot of ways to find me. I'm also on Twitter as well. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions. The beginning and end of this, though, is I hope you've got a sense of the basics about audiobooks, about getting into them, and some of the tools that you would need and the techniques that you would need to learn in order to be successful. That said, if you're thinking about doing it, I absolutely encourage you to go for it. And I'm certainly happy to help you get started. Good luck. I hope you can join me. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. I really appreciate your time, and I hope this was helpful to you. Have a good day.